Um, I'm Garrett. I'm Katie. And what housekeeping items do we have? Since I always forget about the housekeeping items. Um, I don't think we have very many, actually. We're doing really well. We've blown right past the 6,000 downloads, which is yep. pretty cool. By the time this comes out, we'll probably have been past 7,000, I think. <laughs> Which is pretty neat. Um, we have a lot of new listeners. Welcome. Um, so to the gravy train. <laughs> yeah, if you're new, who? If you're new, I encourage you to join Patreon to listen to a beer exploding live on air. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was nice. There was a, a thick head, and uh, well, right in the mouth. Yeah. Well, not really, though. That was the problem. Right outside the mouth. It was a premature ejection. <laughs> yeah. There was um, a, a little hesitancy with the head mm. and swallowing, which caused a bigger explosion. Go figure. You really leaned right into that metaphor, huh? I absolutely did. Have you <laughs> met my boyfriend? I feel like... <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Um, so, welcome to the new listeners. What's up to the existing listeners and we are continuing our hormone series today i'm excited i've been thinking about this a lot especially with like the medical bias stuff and then like yeah you know what it is like flowing together very yeah yeah like with ptsd we talked about like cortisol and those hormones and how all that gets triggered so i've been thinking like wow i can't wait to hear about yeah more hormone stuff yeah and it is like wild that now that i'm researching other things, all the things, you know, we, we say that all the time. Like, oh my God, this connects back to like X, Y, and Z that we talked about. But you really do realize like, oh God, oh my God. <laughs> well, I guess you don't have to tune into Patreon <laughs> to hear a disaster live on air. God. Oh my God. I spilled my water everywhere. <laughs> Put me to bed. Jesus. I knew when I said it there, I'm like, this is a gamble, but it'll be fine. I have it wedged. Nope, I didn't. See, the problem is that you were trying to use my confidence. <sighs> I was with a lid that doesn't lock shut. Oh, now, isn't boy. that the lid that you also like spilled on your laptop? Like in your bag one time when we were coming upstairs? Yeah. Yeah. Because I like having, uh, I have these silicone straws. Yeah. And I like them because I have a tendency, I like drinking out of a straw. But when I bring it up to my mouth, I hit my teeth yeah. if it's a hard plastic straw or a metal straw. So I got those because I was like, this is perfect. I won't accidentally knock my tooth out or chip my tooth. Um, problem being that then I can't close the top and I have to leave it open, which usually is fine unless I'm clumsy. <laughs> those so, rare occasions. <laughs> it never happens. There's definitely not a coffee stain on the cubicle wall at work from you. <laughs> gigantic <laughs> gigantic coffee stain and the problem is it's like those soft cubicle walls so it immediately absorbs yes you spill it and it's like gone can't yes. clean it off it's there forever um, <laughs> yes i have already apologized to the person that's going to be moving into that desk about the coffee stain that i may or may not have caused <laughs> seems to be so, with drinks primarily that i have a problem there seems to be some issues yes um <laughs> anyway <laughs> Yes, I am realizing that smooth, like literally everything has to do with hormones. Everything. Yes. Like all the things. Yeah, it's really wild. Um, but great for our content. So, yeah, endless. Yeah. Endless uh, hormone content. So, what did you say we were covering today? Uh, we are talking about polycystic ovarian syndrome. We are also, by proxy, then going to cover diabetes. And I also have some infertility coverage. I tried to dip into like PCOS and ADHD. So that's like real brief that I'll just touch on at the end. But um, yeah, it was a lot of information. And it was kind of like the other hormone episodes where like I was just going to cover PCOS, but then it just is con- connected to all these other things. Yeah. And it's like, well, I guess we're talking about this too. Um, so um, PCOS stands for polycystic ovarian syndrome. It affects anywhere from 6 to 12% of U.S. women of reproductive age. So that's as many as 5 million people. Um, And it affects, like, every race, every ethnicity. It's not – it doesn't seem to be discriminating in that way. So just if you have a uterus. Yes. 6 to 12%. Yes. 
Um, will you? <laughs> I'm gonna get mad. Can't wait. Uh, <laughs> does do you still have PCOS if you have a hysterectomy? Um, or like if you have your ovaries removed? I'm going to guess it probably lessens the symptoms, but that you probably still have it. Oh, okay. Because like at one point I do mention, um. Like a lot of women, a lot of people don't even know they have it until they are in their childbearing, until they hit um, puberty and they start getting their period. But um, they said that because there's so many co- comorbidities with it, then when you hit menopause, like maybe if you're not experiencing those, you may still have all these other comorbidities oh, okay. that go with it. So I think it's one of those things like you can try and get around it, but ultimately it's still, it's like going to get you somehow, kind of. Great. Yeah, really uplifting content today. Um, <laughs> so, and this, it, it is described as like a lifelong health condition. Um, and a lot of women that, or a lot of people that have it don't know it. So they said in one study, up to 70% of women, people with PCOS haven't been diagnosed. 70%? Yep, 70%. <gasps> oh my goodness. I mean, if you listen to our I think our first medical bias episode, yes. I directly asked my physician That's true. if I had it, and he looked me dead in my face and said, no, no thought, no consideration. Nope, you don't have that. Um, I do, but anyway, so <laughs> <laughs> um, PCOS is a leading cause of infertility, and again, a lot of um, people don't know that they have it until they attempt to get pregnant. But the symptoms tend to start with the start of the menstrual cycle. Interesting. Um, And, you know, considering how common it is, it's it's really not a ton known about PCOS, which is, you know, like how tracks. Yeah, well, how could they possibly study it? It involves hormones. And women. Females. Right. Um, I mean, God, Garrett. (laughs) How dare you ask such a question? I mean, yeah, it's like you don't even. How dare you? You don't even think. (laughs) Do you even go here? Um, and there is a large overlap, which it is surprising that there isn't as much known about it because there's a significant overlap between PCOS and um, diabetes linked with insulin resistance, but I'll get more into that in a bit. Um, so we had talked about in our, and it is kind of, there's like a lot of little moving parts with this that kind of all connect to each other. So I'm going to try and go through this in like a logical way, but I do feel like I'm jumping around a little bit. But I'll, I will tell you if I can't understand. Yes, you will. And you know, it's <laughs> funny, like when I put my episodes together, I have to kind of like talk myself through it and I will go back and like insert information. I'm like, I know Katie's going to ask me this, so I'm just going to be prepared with this. <laughs> um, but it's good because then we make sure we have all our bases covered. So we had talked about in the menstrual cycle episode – um, you know, your ovulatory phase is when that mat- mature egg is released from the ovary for the purpose of fertilization. Get out of here, you stupid egg. If it's, <laughs> it gets, I actually have in all caps, it gets ejected from the body during your period. Right. If it's not fertilized. Pew. Um, yeah, like a, like a Nerf gun. Yeah. Like a little spitball just shooting out. Yeah. Just, just like, like that. that. Same size too. <laughs> also the size of a spitball. Mm, that makes sense. <laughs> Sperms are also enormous. <laughs> yes. Yes, the sperms are enormous. This is a scientific podcast. <laughs> um, in PCOS, the person doesn't make enough of the hormones typically needed to ovulate. Okay. So when the ovulation doesn't happen, the ovaries can develop these small cysts inside So it's the almost like, ovary. like a, a pimple. Like it's something's kind of. not getting out. Yeah, yeah, so kind it gets of. inflamed. Um, And those cysts can actually produce hormones called androgens, which is a male sex hormone. The cysts themselves can produce that. So like we've mentioned before that everybody, it doesn't matter your gender identity or your biological sex at birth, no matter what, everybody has a balance of male and female sex hormones. Yes. Um, And there's a ton of different hormone imbalances that can happen. So PCOS is one of those hormone imbalances where you have too much of the androgen hormones. Um, is that where the word androgynous comes from? Probably. Hmm. Probably, yeah. I don't know, but... It wasn't in your notes for a question. No, it ask. wasn't. <laughs> um, but I'm going to confidently say probably. <laughs> so, um, But that makes sense, though, because isn't PCOS also linked with, like, more... Um, 
like dark or thicker body hair. Oh yeah, there's so a that whole would list track. of symptoms. Yeah, like if you're having more male, yeah, sex hormones that you would have. There's a whole list of symptoms that cause a lot of yeah. It, it probably is androgynous. That's probably where it comes from. Um, so people with PCOS having those high level of androgens, it's usually only present in small amounts for women. Um, without PCOS, without PCOS. Yeah. So those androgens can disrupt ovulation, menstruation, and cause a lot of the symptoms that people experience. Um, And they already exist in people with PCOS at that higher level, but it's then made worse by the the cysts. So if you have PCOS and you've had, like, say, an ultrasound of your ovaries, your provider may have mentioned, like, a pearled appearance to your ovaries. Um, So that's meaning that those eggs that haven't fully matured – and then triggered that re- you don't have that um, that hormone, that luteinizing hormone that's causing that to be released or enough of that causing it to be released. You hang on to those little follicles with each menstrual cycle instead of the egg ejecting and the follicle like dying off and disappearing. Right. So you wind up collected inside your ovary what looks like a string of pearls because you have all of these little follicles that haven't gone away um so those ovarian cysts are like little fluid <laughs> fluid filled sacks you're welcome for that one um to patreon for more fluid filled sack discussions oh, yeah or previous episodes to talk about uh gangrenous flappy doodles i got it in oh he's gonna be so mad <laughs> <laughs> oh god um so those little sacks are holding on to those immature eggs some People with PCOS don't have ovarian cysts. Hmm. Some people do develop them. Um, and what I did not know is the ovary is about the size and shape of an almond. I had no idea it was that tiny. I had no idea it was that big. <laughs> this is like the Cheerio thing all over again. <laughs> <laughs> Everything is the size of a Cheerio. <laughs> What do you mean it's the size of a, an almond? That's bigger than a Cheerio. It can't possibly be. Huh. Um, so I personally have um, had ultrasounds where they tell me I've had that pearled appearance inside my ovaries and have also had a cyst that ruptured. Um, it is extremely painful. And now when I know that the ovary is about the size of an almond, my um, ovarian cyst was the size of a golf ball. Wow. So significantly larger yeah. than my ovary. And it doesn't rupture your ovary? It can. So, like, I lucked out in that when mine ruptured, I didn't have, like, extensive bleeding. I didn't have infection. You can have a torsion where it twists with your ovary and it can, like, kill your ovary, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, so I lucked out that I didn't wind up with, like, ovarian damage. Yeah. But, I mean... They can, they're, it's like a serious thing. Yeah. Um, they basically just like gave me pain medication and I basically laid in bed for a week. It took like a week to yeah. pass. I mean, and it was, the pain, the abdominal pain was so intense. I couldn't stand up straight and I was dry heaving. It was so, so, acu- it was just, whew, it was intense. I mean, I've heard stories also of like, even when you have a ruptured cyst or you have a golf ball sized cyst that's causing pain that they're still not necessarily like doctors and ERs are not necessarily even diagnosing that problem. Like whether they're not diagnosing PCOS as an actual syndrome you have, they're not even diagnosing the cyst being the problem. Yeah. They it told me I had be, a UTI. Yeah. Like nondescript abdominal pain. Yeah. Cause I, I was still, I think I was 17. So I went to peds mm-hmm. and they were like, you probably just have a, a UTI. I was like, I don't have a UTI. I was like, I like, I would have known before this point that I had right. a UTI. And a UTI pain as somebody who had a very severe one once. I don't um, know that I've ever had a UTI. You Certainly would, not as an adult. You would know. <laughs> <laughs> um, because you, f- when you have a UTI, at least as a, what it's felt like for me, I've had them twice. Um, and it's like you con- you constantly have that feeling like, if I don't get to a toilet right now, like I'm going to pee my pants. Pee. Yeah. 
And then you get to the toilet and absolutely nothing happens. Right. And no matter, like, how hard you try, you cannot pee. When you do pee, it's extremely, like, cloudy, almost, like, milky, but huh. yellow. Yeah. Um, And it is really, really painful. But the pain is very much in, for me anyway, was in my urethra. Oh, yeah. No, like, this was, like, abdominal yeah, pain. Exactly. Like, I was afraid it was, um like, appendicitis, but it was mm-hmm. on the wrong side. Yeah. So it was very different pain than UTI. Well, and pain. it's like, I feel like also with a UTI, like you're going to have UTI symptoms before you reach the point that you're dry heaving and you're yes. in the ER. Well, if that was the case, then you would have, I think you would have like blood in your urine. Right. Like in my head, even as a 17 year old and sitting with my mom, who is an RN, we're both like, no, there's been no, I was not the type of kid to not tell my mom if I thought I had a UTI. You know what or I mean? the type so, of kid to wipe back to front. Right. Or to like, <laughs> I mean, we've talked about before, you know, growing up with parents in the medical field. Yeah. Unless you were like really sick or really hurt, you didn't go. There were so many like home remedies or things that like could really be treated by X, Y, and Z. You had a parent that could tell, yes, this is something you need to go to the doctor for. No, this is not something you need to go to the doctor for. Right. So for me and my mom to both be like, oh, shit, this is serious. We need to go to the emergency room. Right. Unheard of. Because if it's a UTI, like, you go to your GP and you're like, right. can you call in the script for the sulfur right. pills or whatever the fuck? I definitely have a UTI. No. So they kept telling me I had a UTI, and I was like, I do not, this is not a UTI. And mind you, like, in, like you almost, like, couldn't even talk through it because yeah. it was just so painful. So they eventually did, and, you know, they don't say anything. So they take me for imaging. My mom is sitting in this room with me and she's watching them do like Doppler studies where they're checking blood flow to a mass in my stomach. And so I can tell by the look on her face that she's freaking out. Yeah. And I'm trying not to freak out. Um, And eventually they diagnose it as a cyst and they say it's rupturing, but that it's fine. I can just go home and like let it, let it rupture. And I had a follow up. They called like, uh, I had been to that office one time when I was like 16. So they just called and whoever was on call um, they were going to give me Tylenol to go home with. And he was like, that is not, a, that's not sufficient. So he called me in, um, I was on hydrocodone, but it was like such a, you like, we really had to like push to even get them to investigate it further than a UTI. And I feel like you're able to push, like, like your mom was able to push for that. Right. Because you're able to say like, listen, I'm a nurse. I've worked in the ER I right. worked in CCU or ICU or something right. like no this is like I'm telling you right this like is something's wrong not like and especially now when everything is digital records but like you can plug in your social security number right. and they can pull up all your records and see oh do they come in you know every other week and they're demanding you know, hydrocodone or, right. you know, opioids, or are they demanding the XYZ test? Right. Like, is there something else going on like here? pattern. Right. But, like, if there's none of that showing. No, it was like, wild. And then even, like, you know, I was a kid, so they're telling me that I had this ovarian cyst that ruptured, but it's fine, just go home and stay in bed until you feel better. Right, which is also bizarre. It freaked me out, because I was like, do I have to have surgery? I guess this- I'm, do you know why you can, like, naturally pass a ruptured cyst but you if your appendix ruptures you're like going to die basically no i mean maybe because like a a cyst isn't an organ i mean it doesn't have like it's not an independent blood flow type situation Mm. but this was like ultimately like your your abdomen is like full of like blood and fluid so your body then has to take that time to like reabsorb that um, so in addition to like the pain from a rupturing, there's also like your, your super bloated. It was really hard to pee for like days after that. So it was, it was just like a very uncomfortable thing. Um, and then like as an adult, when I came off the pill, I was really worried. I was like, man, I don't, that took me out. Like I was down, down for like three or four days, but yeah. didn't really feel like myself for over a week. <clears throat> so I'm like, I don't. And up to 12% of the uterus having population has this problem. Yes. And I mean, if anybody wow. has had an ovarian cyst before, I mean, I really lucked out in my situation. Doesn't feel like I did, but I did. Um, and if you've had a cyst in the past, you're more likely to develop, to develop more in the future. Cool. Yeah. Which is what a another relief. fun little tidbit. Yeah. Um, so the causes, shockingly, 
the causes of PCOS. The exact cause is not clear. <laughs> um, but why would we try and find that out? Because it only impacts people Right. With yeah. Okay. So <laughs> up to 70% of people with PCOS have insulin resistance, meaning that their cells can't use insulin properly. So this is kind of how I started down this diabetes gotcha. rabbit hole. So insulin is a hormone from the pancreas. The pancreas produces it to help the body use sugar from food for energy. So it, it's taking that, um, the sugar that your body's processing, and it's getting it to your cells. So when the cells can't use the insulin property properly, <laughs> there's going to be more of that, um, the body's demand for insulin then increases. So then your pancreas is making more insulin to compensate for that demand that's there that's wrong right and those extra insulin levels also trigger your ovaries to produce more androgen so then it turns oh. into like this cycle so it's like the more intense your symptoms get it it just like picks up speed right um well and then like an increased production of insulin isn't that like tied to like weight gain Oh, yeah. So then you, you wind so up then, in this cycle. Yeah. So you've got ovaries that are triggered to produce more androgen. But then you wind up with cysts that are also producing more androgens. Right. So, it, yeah, it can really get... And fat tissue stores estrogen. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> your estrogen isn't free-flowing then. Whatever estrogen you do have, it's just... Everything's bad. Chilling <laughs> in your booty. <laughs> Yes, that's where I store it. Making all the boys jealous. Uh, <laughs> something about milkshakes. Bow, bow, bow. So, again, <laughs> this is the, the little side side quest that we're taking on diabetes. Hmm. Um, so, like I was saying, the body breaks down that food into sugar, glucose, releases it into your bloodstream. So then your blood sugar goes up. Your pancreas is then triggered to release insulin. And then the insulin is, like, what helps your body get it to your cells to use for energy. Right. So with diabetes, your body isn't making enough of the insulin or can't use it as well as it should. So when there's not enough insulin or the cells stop responding to the insulin, there's too much blood sugar in your bloodstream, which over time can cause like, you know, heart disease, vision loss, kidney disease, neuropathy, yeah, a yeah. whole slew of problems. Um, and there's multiple different kinds of diabetes. So there's type one, which is really thought of to be more as like an autoimmune reaction. Um, so that reaction stops your body from making insulin, which is a hormone imbalance. Um, but, but that's the one you're born with. Yes. Basically. Yep. So <clears throat> five to 10% of the people who have diabetes have type one. Oh, wow. Um, and those symptoms usually develop quickly and it's usually diagnosed in like kids, teens, like young adults. Yeah. I know somebody whose child was diagnosed with diabetes when he was like an older toddler because he was still like, it was her last child, and he was still nursing, like at night, would just like, yeah, almost like a security blanket yeah, like thing. Yeah. yeah. And she finally weaned him, like in like when he was like four. Mm -hmm. And then he ended up getting diagnosed with diabetes, and they think that he was getting what he needed from her breast milk. Wow. And that was what was, and that's why it like took her so long to wean him. Because he would, like, freak the fuck right, out. His, his body was, like, using that to regulate yes. insulin levels. Yeah. That's that crazy. Yeah. Man, But they didn't wild. find out about it until he was, like, in grade school. Holy shit. Yeah. That's crazy. Um, people that have type 1 diabetes have to take insulin every day to survive. And they really don't know how to prevent it. And I thought there was also – I thought I had heard there was, like, a genetic component to type 1 but I could be wrong because I didn't read it. Like if it's hereditary, that. you mean? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know either. I felt like I knew somebody that had it and it was hereditary. I don't remember. I know that gestational diabetes can be hereditary. It's common. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I figured. <laughs> um, there's type 2 diabetes where your body doesn't use insulin well and then it can't keep your blood sugar at normal levels. Um, so 90 to 95% of people with diabetes have type 2 and it usually develops in adults, but they're more and more commonly seeing it in children, teens, and young adults. Hmm. Um, and y people may not even notice symptoms, so they're saying it is important to make sure, like, you're getting those levels tested, you know, with your – and I know, like, my doctor 
that's part of my like routine drug panel. She always yes. checks my. Yeah, I just had mine done. Or something. Yeah. Yep, or I, I think they just test blood glucose because yeah. mine was 89 and I had yeah. fasting blood work, which is what it's supposed to be. Yeah. So, um, And that's what's crazy is like all the PCOS symptoms I have, which I'll get into after this, I don't have this insulin. My blood sugar is always like spot on. Good. Nothing else is in my well. blood work. But man, my blood sugar is always good. <laughs> At least you're not having that issue. That's true. That's, that that is one... Mm. Now I don't even want to say it out loud. Um, <laughs> and they say too, like if you're at risk, you know, type two diabetes can be either prevented or delayed by, you know, weight loss, healthy diet, activity, shit like that. Right. Um, gestational diabetes develops in pregnant people who have never had diabetes. Yes. Um, and if you have it, your baby can be at a higher risk for health problems. It usually the the pregnant person's gestational diabetes usually goes away after the baby's born, but I know some people do just wind up maintaining like a diabetic state, and it's it kind does. of like um like preeclampsia, right? Like it should resolve but at delivery, but sometimes it doesn't. Yeah, um, and it does increase your risk for type two later in life. Yeah, I knew that. Your baby's also more likely to um, develop obesity or type two diabetes later in life. Um, yeah, usually know. they'll. I've I've heard that if you have gestational diabetes, a lot of doctors will induce you before forty weeks because your baby is they much get more big. Yeah, your baby will be much bigger. Yeah, they get even beefy. if your gestational diabetes is well controlled. Right. Um, yeah, it causes like a weight increase, birth weight. Yeah. Um, and then there's also pre diabetes, and here's a wild statistic: in the United States, ninety six million. Adults, so more than one in three, have pre-diabetes. <laughs> more than eight in ten of them don't know it. What are the signs of pre-diabetes? Um, so your blood sugar levels are higher than normal, but you don't meet the... You're, like, on the road to type 2, but you're not there yet. Okay. Um, so it raises your risk for type 2, obviously, and, like, heart disease and stroke... But it's one of those things that, like, they can give you, like, metformin and lifestyle changes and you can reverse it and go back to, like, normal blood sugar huh. levels. So I think that's a way to, like, catch it, which, again, is why it's important to have, like, routine An checkups. physical, yeah. Because this is something that, you know, they can say, okay, the last two years you've had this, we're going to consider you pre-diabetic. So, like, these are the changes that need to be made. And totally. And eventually avoid something that can, like, shorten Thanks, your Obama. <laughs> Thanks a fucking lot. <laughs> Annual medical visits. What am I? A farm animal? <laughs> Tune into our Patreon episode <laughs> to hear about farm animals. Um, oh, McDonald. <laughs> anyway, back to PCOS. So genetics also plays a role. PCOS can run in families. It's common for, you know, sisters, mother, daughter, um, I know I don't think I'm the only woman in my family to have these symptoms. I just think other people haven't been diagnosed, ultimately. That's weird. That's, that doesn't track for so anything else that we've covered. strange that mm. that happens. Um, I wonder what the diagnosis rate would be if uh, people with wieners could get PCOS. Yeah, it would probably be super high, and there would be a cure for it. Um, oh, but we don't have to compare to men. <laughs> There's an arm movement and a, a head bob that went with that just because you can't see it. Um, <laughs> it's really too bad that that wasn't video. <laughs> was, it really went with the tone. It was good. Um, <sighs> also, they think that there is a, a, I guess, like a component of low-grade inflammation that can be involved in this. So your white blood cells are making a substance in response to infection or injury, and you, you kind of are always running with that low hmm. rate of white blood cell activity. Um, so research shows that people with PCOS have like a long-term low-grade inflammation that they think leads the ovaries to produce androgens, um, or leads polycystic ovaries to produce Oh, androgens. okay. So again... We don't really know. We're just kind of. It sounds like maybe. though, like an autoimmune disorder. Then, yeah. if your white blood cells right. are theoretically triggering that first androgen right. response, and ultimately, like the insulin resistance, also sounds like it's a more of an autoimmune. Thing. Right. I will say, 
like, especially that it comes out, like, once you hit puberty and you start menstruating, that that's when it, you start actually, like, seeing those symptoms play yeah, out. Definitely. It makes sense. But that's also how I ended up, or how, like, so my clotting disorder, Von mm-hmm. Willebrand's disease, that's how it was discovered. Because this guy's daughters kept hitting puberty and would hemorrhage to death with their first menstrual cycle. Holy shit. Yeah. They, they had a more severe form than I do. But... <laughs> I just thought it would be important to mention right now. <laughs> but, like, that's how they discovered it. And Holy it was, like, shit. like everyone in his family had it. But the daughters were the ones that, like, once they hit puberty. So, like, it turned to this whole thing of, like, well, why is it, you know, like, why are they bleeding to death with their first menstrual cycle? So like, weird. that's weird. Yeah. Maybe we should, like, look into that. <laughs> huh. But, yeah, it, like, it wasn't about it starting yeah. at puberty. Like, they had it since birth. It just, that's where... Something happened that made you notice the problem, which it sounds right. like that's what this is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can um, cover that in a different episode. <laughs> oh, we probably should. That would be an interesting episode yeah. to do. Because now uh, we have no bosses, so we can do whatever we want. It's true. Um, so that, um, you know, long-term inflammation can also lead to, like, heart and blood vessel problems. Um, and then you've got also the component of obesity can, you know, increase insulin levels and can increase inflammation and then make PCOS worse. PCOS was di- was described to me as like a spectrum diagnosis, which as time goes on, I feel like everything's a spectrum diagnosis. But anyway, um, yeah. <laughs> some it's people... not an excuse to not treat it or study it, though. Like correct. <sighs> um. So some some people just have one symptom; others have all the symptoms. Um. The symptoms include. Oh boy. Missed, irregular, very light, or very heavy periods. Oh, when you said missed, I was, I heard M I S T. Yes, I was like, a what? What is this? <laughs> You're just damp it's always. Like drizzled, you know. <laughs> that would be a horrible. <laughs> Constantly just like damp. dewy. <laughs> dewy. <laughs> dewy. Um, okay, so missed, irregular. Very light or very heavy periods. Okay. Um, which is primarily caused by too much of the androgens. Okay. Um, I know like not misty. Not misty. Um <laughs> I part of the part of my case when I asked my my gynecologist was I have I've always had irregular periods. Like I would get a period and it would I would spot for a few days and then I wouldn't get it for six months and then I would have a period for three weeks straight that was like incredibly heavy. So that was part of my <laughs> reason for asking about it, in addition to the cyst that ruptured. Yeah. But apparently so you had not. irregular, misty, and heavy periods. All of those. Yeah. Um, Are you we have... sure it's not mist as a symptom? <laughs> mit, 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 <laughs> mist? 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 Are you saying midst or mist? <laughs> Pan or Pam? <laughs> Um, ovaries that are large or have many cysts, like I was saying, the, uh, So they're the size of two almonds. Two almonds. It's mm. like a, almost a hand. Like a almond. walnut instead of an almond. It's a pecan. Mmm. Macadamia nut? Uh-huh. Those are nice. Those would be tiny. Tinier. I thought macadamia... What are the... Oh, Brazil nuts. That's yes. That's what I'm thinking of. Yes. The ones that are like little bananas. Yes. The macadamia nuts are little... little they look like chickpeas, I think. Oh, I thought what? that was a hazelnut. I think those also look like, but I think they're brown. <laughs> Tune into our new podcast about nuts. Nutcast. <laughs> that would also go with Patreon, actually. Yeah. We're talking about nuts a lot today. Yeah, we are. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> um, so like I said, like my ovaries had that pearled appearance where I had all the, all yeah. the follicles in there. Um, excess body hair, including on the chest, stomach, and back. And the name of this I see all the time. And it's one of those words that I read all the time, but I never say out loud, so I don't know the correct way to pronounce it. Okay. Do you want to say it now? Hirsutism. Hirsutism? H-I-R-S-U-T-I-S-M. Hirsutism. Hirsutism? Hirsutism. I don't know. Hirsutism sounds right. Correct me if I'm wrong, I guess. Um, Weight gain, especially like around the tum, I've also seen described as like kind of having an apple shape. Okay. Um... Acne or oily skin, which is also from those excess of male hormones. Mm-hmm. Um, male pattern baldness or thinning hair. 
Mm. Infertility, um, skin tags on the neck or armpits, dark or thick skin patches on the back of the neck, in the armpits, under the breasts, which is also tied to that insulin resistance. Oh, okay. Um, and headaches, thought to be caused by hormones. I and then I've also that... seen, like, um, depression and anxiety looped in as symptoms. Or track. Yeah. Remember that post I sent you on Instagram that said, yes. like, like cysts, like, people end up with cysts in their underarms from shaving? So we're going to talk another another example of TMI. So... I, (laughs) every time I shaved my armpits, I had like razor rash and it would like, so I would put deodorant and then it would burn. So I would try and wait like as long as I could between like shaving my underarms. And eventually I gave up and I was like, you know what? We're just going to let these little ladies be free. So I just am au natural and don't shave my armpits anymore. Much the chagrin of people in my life sometimes. (laughs) But um, you trim it. It's I not do like trim it, and it's really readable. it's not it's really not it's not really not bad. And you know what? It's honestly been kind of empowering because I feel like you can't fucking tell me patriarchy. But anyway, um, Katie randomly sends me this article. She's like, "Hey, I just saw this thing, and it was an article about how that symptom can be caused by PCOS." And then I threw my phone across the room. Yeah, Garrett got real mad about it. But yeah, no, it it was like something I happened to see on Instagram and it was like, um, like this, and I don't even know, it was like from the New York Times or something, like it was like a reputable source, it wasn't like some bullshit influencer or something. Or like a doctor or something was talking about it. Yeah, something, and it was like about how underarm cystic acne or cystic acne infections or something Mm -hmm. Um, is tied to PCOS. And I was like, hey, this might be w- explaining why you had such a problem with that. Yes. Because it wasn't just like razor burn. It was like... It would be, it would be like, like, a, like a breakout cysts. in my yeah. And, and you don't have that problem when you shave your legs. Like you shave yeah. your legs. Yeah. And so, the other thing is like, so I've never... I mean, I've always had... I definitely have to like stay on top of washing my face and using mm-hmm. a proper moisturizer because my skin will break out. But um, when I had the Mirena IUD, which is a terrible combination specifically for people with PCOS, I wound up with cystic acne on my face, like, constantly. Yeah. I would have these, like, huge, like, painful red, like, lumps, especially I get them all, like, around my chin is mm-hmm. always where, I, even now, where I get them. I got them a lot in first trimester, which I'm assuming is the hormones being all over the fucking place. But anyway. At least um, everybody with pregnancy complains about acne, I feel like. Yeah, it's like it's it's one of those things. Either they have great skin or acne. You, actually, no, they're all just glowing skin from the acne, the sheen, yeah, the, of the, the sweating that you're inflamed. doing. All the time. I'm sweating right now, and I don't even know why. I'm sitting still, and I'm. I always get sweaty when we record. I, whenever we like step out of this room, I end up being like, let's get real toasty. Oh, it's cooler out here. <laughs> I was actually kind of warm. Are we full of hot air? That can't be it. <laughs> no. Um, so yeah, like I, so I have the periods, I have the, um, the cystic ovaries. I definitely have always had, uh, a mustache. Um, yeah, I would say like kind of oily skin. I, my hair is definitely thinning like at my temples Mm -hmm. and I feel like a little bit like on the crown of my head too. Um, and obviously infertility, which we're going to talk about in a bit. Um, But I don't have, like, the skin tags or any of that. But, I mean, it's, like, a lot of the things that you see where it's talking about depression and anxiety are then tied to, it's probably because you're experiencing all these, like, very visible symptoms. Totally. Like, that's gonna not going to make you feel cute. No. I mean, it's it's not uncommon for... Plus having the bloating in your stomach so you have this, like, apple shape and... Totally. don't feel good about yourself. And, I mean, they're talking about, like, like, heavier... There, there's also like a, uh, I guess it's not in this list, but there's also a correlation between like wind, winding up with like a beard. Yeah. Because you've got these male hormones that are too strong. And I'm, I'm, as I've gotten older, I definitely have sharper chin hairs. They're not quite as wispy <laughs> as they used to be. <laughs> well, it's I also. I had a gray one recently, which was rude and disrespectful. <laughs> I had a gray <laughs> eyebrow hair that I had to pluck like right from the center. And I, it was like, it wasn't even gray. It was white that's rough. it was like i'll sit there listening and I'm like, like elsa <laughs> i can't find this sharp thing that i'm feeling what and it'll be like days and then finally like, oh my god it's white that's why i can't find it yeah it's rude it is rude um 
I wonder also if, um, not that I endorse this, but women who were in traveling circuses as like bearded ladies or like I really did not know where that was going for a second I was like traveling circuses <laughs> what oh if they had PCOS yeah. Yeah. and that was why they could be this bearded lady yeah. and be extra hairy I may I couldn't be a bearded lady but I could definitely be like a goatee lady probably at this point um I drew a mustache onto myself when I was Ron Burgundy for Halloween in law school and because our law school hosted a costumed Halloween party in the school gym yeah. and nobody recognized me. <laughs> I mean, I guess it would be worse if like, they were like, oh, hey, Katie, you look great. You look like your normal self with your mustache. I guess, but it was just as concerning that I looked very convincing as, as Ron Burgundy. <laughs> like, like I walked up to people and I was like, hey, how's it going? Blah, blah, blah. Me thinking it was very obvious. And uh, nope. I've had I had multiple people say, "Oh my God, Katie, I didn't realize it was you." Disrespectful. Mm -hmm. It's almost as disrespectful as a white chin hair. I'll tell you that. Almost. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, there are some people who experience an improvement in their PCOS symptoms at menopause, but comorbidities, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, um, are also then more frequently a problem after menopause. So you know, it's like a lose lose. Cool. Um, so PCOS diagnosis. Oh boy. Clearly, just asking your gynecologist isn't sufficient. <laughs> or having um, symptoms and then or asking Or having your symptoms and asking your gynecologist about it directly. <laughs> um, so it tends to be a combination of things. Medical history, um, you know, talking about your symptoms, a physical exam, likely involving a pelvic exam, um, and they want to check the health of your reproductive organs. It says inside and outside of your body. But I definitely saw a provider. I keep all of mine inside my body. I do tend to store mine internally. Yeah. And you know, like when you go to the gynecologist and they just like straight up finger you for your, yeah. your pelvic exam, I had a provider tell me that there's no point to that. She was like, it doesn't accomplish anything. Which as she said that, I was like, yeah, I mean, it kind of makes sense. Cause like, what are you, what are you feeling? If you want to feel guess. my belly, if you want to palpate my stomach, you can palpate my stomach. I guess I my understanding that. was that they were, cause like at, when I've had it done, they were pushing down on the outside of my yeah. stomach as well so i thought they were like pushing my buttons into their fingers pushing up my buttons baby <laughs> that's what that song's about right <laughs> definitely um well i remember one time being like oh when they were doing that i was like oh are you checking to see if there's another ovarian cyst they were like nope and they just kept going so i'm like so what are you what are you feeling for because uterine and ovarian and cervical cancer are all wildly underdiagnosed and are deadly because they don't get caught until they're like stage four. So what are you feeling for? Because it's not a cyst and it's not a tumor and how much are you actually feeling? So anyway. No, you seem totally fine. I'm totally fine with it. You um, want another non-alcoholic beer? You did so well with the last one. Do you want, do you want another beer that doesn't have anything that will settle you in it? Um... <laughs> And some, some of the symptoms with PCOS are like linked to other health problems or can also be symptoms of other health problems. So, um, they may also wind up doing an ultrasound or a blood test as a heads up in case you don't know, the ultrasound will be a transvaginal ultrasound more than likely. Yes. That means that they put a stick inside your vagooter, like a, uh, it's like a very long, straight dildo with a plastic bag on the end. And you know what's better is they call it a wand. Yes, a little wanda. <laughs> and then what gets me, and I'll talk about, when we talk about infertility, I've had a lot of these. And sometimes they'll say, would you like to guide it in? I don't, just I do it. I hate that phrasing. Just do it. I don't want to reach under this thing, this paper towel smock, and guide it in for you. Just Yeah, for it. when I, so I've had one ultrasound my whole life oh, um God, I've had and it was like a year ago um but it was transvaginal just because I wasn't I had to switch my birth control it wasn't like a huge issue mm -hmm. but they did an ultrasound just to make sure there wasn't something else going on because my um I have like a family history of like fibroids mm -hmm. so I just wanted to make sure that it wasn't something like that yeah reasonable and um also good to like just from like a medical perspective I feel like having a baseline 
So we knew at this point that you did not have them. Totally. Actually, my doctor, my GP, um, I just had my physical, and he said that there's a new recommendation out that having a baseline mammogram done once you're 35 mm-hmm. is the new recommendation. So I'm having a mammo done yeah. next month. It's not painful. Yeah, I'm not expect- – yeah. based on your experience, I'm yeah, not I was like, it to be painful. I was terrified when I went in because you heard all these horror stories. Totally. And no, it was like super gentle. They had like a new machine that's like very high tech. And he actually said – my GP said um, – it was funny because obviously he didn't know that we had had that conversation about like the aging tissue. Mm-hmm. But he like explained yeah. that like as you get older, you your mammary tissue. glands are replaced by fat tissue, mm-hmm. which come – it looks like more dense tissue on – a mammogram so he's like if I call you and say I want to do an ultrasound just to make sure Mm -hmm. don't panic it's just because (laughs) that's what happens to breast tissue yes like when he like explained it before it happened oh I love my doctor yeah because like I went and they did both yeah and like when they my mammogram was fine but when they looked at the ultrasound I had dark spots on the ultrasound and like briefly panicked and they explained to me like this is just the loss of yeah they're basically telling me like your titties are getting old yeah. And they're Which sagging. made me feel a little <laughs> bit better, though, about them sagging because it's like, well, of course they sag because it's fat tissue as opposed to something Correct. that's a functional organ. Yeah, I have no – that is not – I mean, I guess, like, as you get older, you can have, like, two different approaches to aging. It can be, like, I'm going to fight this tooth and nail or I'm going to embrace it because it's just, like, part of it. So, like, I don't know. I feel like it's just – I know that it's – that's nature. Like, my – Boobs are going to get real long as time goes on, and I'm going to have crow's feet. And I think they look cute. And that's you just like crows. Long titties are just going to be part of my life. I don't know <laughs> that we could it. say that long titties look cute. Um, if I fold them up in a bra, who knows the difference? Just your spouse. Just me and my spouse. <laughs> I'll have to um, ask and you can like flap them out to the side like stabilizers at Man, night. Man, if I could tuck them under my arms, yeah, that'd be great. Um, no, I mean, I fully – expect that I'll have a reduction done at some point once I'm done having kids. But. I think mine are just going to deflate so I won't have to worry about a reduction. That's what happened to my mom. Yeah. She said she blamed my brother and I for eating her boobs, how yeah. she put it. That's reasonable. Yeah. I had a friend that compared her boobs to National Geographic after she finished breastfeeding. Cool. Yeah, she said they were fully deflated. So, And she was like super busty beforehand. So I'm like, hey, you know what? If that means I can just smush them into a smaller bra. That I was going to say, yeah, if I could like right <laughs> wear a regular bralette and not like cool. a special order nasa approved bralette oh, wait i do have a i do have a bra story real quick so <laughs> i bought a intern maternity a maternity slash nursing bra and mm-hmm. it's like one of those like crisscross ones where it's yeah. got like the deep v and i thought oh like it looked comfortable it had good reviews and i don't read the size chart because i'm never going to fit in the size chart but usually if it's stretchy enough it'll work so i bought a large um and I put it on and I was like, well, this is a home bra. Definitely can't wear this out of the house because it's not going to hold them in place. Um, and I was doing some painting and, you know, rolling. So my arm is like up and down. My whole boob popped out of that bra. The whole thing. So that is a nursing bra. Yes. Now you know the difference. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, look, it, it's designed so that if you just move the right way, it pops it on its own. Yeah. Baby Looks can feed efficient. itself. Yeah. <laughs> just a titty vending machine. <laughs> oh my god um anyway so yeah transvaginal ultrasound uh blood tests where they're looking at like, oh yeah that's how we got on that yes. yeah no having to put the wand into myself i felt like i was being it's awkward watched while i masturbated reasonable yeah at least you're in a dark room <laughs> i suppose but with somebody i've never kissed before so. yeah there so one one place i had it done the place that you got undressed was across the room and then you grabbed your smock in the bathroom and walked over. So I'm walking around just like porky pig in it across this big long room to get back to the thing. <laughs> Very uncomfortable that my whole ass is out, of, out in no clothes. Um, Loosen up my buttons, baby. Your soul. <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> Thank you for asking. Um, when they do those blood tests, they're looking for not only like blood glucose levels, they may be checking your cholesterol and triglycerides, and they're also looking at, you know, androgen and other like testosterone hormone okay. levels. Um, the treatment of PCOS. Wait, I have a question. Yeah. Do any of those things show up when they test your thyroid in a blood test? 
I don't know because I know I've had them check my thyroid level before. I think it's part of my normal panel of blood yeah, work. Yeah, mine too. Um, I don't know. Okay. I, they didn't mention anything about your thyroid levels okay. with this. But, you know, what? I'm assuming if you've got, like, some of the insulin resistance and the weight gain that they may be thinking that's also hypothyroidism. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's actually before – yeah, I know I had them tested at one point when I was having trouble, like, having problems with weight. Um, so treatment of PCOS. This, I was, the the finishing number on this section was, it shook me. There's, like, a lot of different approaches to this, and it definitely depends on, like, your overall health, how severe the symptoms are, and, like, what your plans are, like, if you plan on becoming pregnant. So... Like, before I was at that point in my life, <clears throat> they had me on the pill, and that's something that they kind of use to control the symptoms anyway. So that's okay. going to kind of restore your hormone imbalance and lower your androgen levels anyway. Um, it'll help regulate ovulation. Um, I thought birth control completely prevented ovulation. Not necessarily. Oh, if you're taking the the duds, then no. you would still ovulate, right? No. <clears throat> No, because you'd ovulate about two weeks before you start bleeding. Yeah. So it hormonal birth control pills can prevent ovulation, mm-hmm. but it that's why it's only ninety seven percent effective. Because which I've also um, read things that ultimately it's more like seventy five percent effective because if you're not taking it like militantly, right? Um, but. Yeah, so that's why the effect, the efficacy rate is what it is, and they can't say it's 100% effective, is not necessarily because of noncompliance or forgetting a dose or not taking it at mm-hmm. the same minute every day. Mm-hmm. Um, it's because in some people, it doesn't actually stop you from ovulating. It just stops you. It, it still triggers when you take that week off. It yeah. triggers a, a menstrual uh, menstruation, so then yeah. whatever – potential ovum had attached Mm -hmm. is evacuated ejected yeah oh i didn't know that so um yeah you can still ovulate when you're on the pill it just depends on what type of hormone cocktail is in it yeah and how that works for you right like your own internal chemistry um so it does help regulate ovulation it does um relieve symptoms it's supposed to help with like excess hair growth um, it does help prevent against endometrial cancer, and it improves acne. Endometrial cancer? Oh, yeah. That's another, like, long-term thing to look out for. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, they can also give you, like, metformin or diabetes medications, which are used to lower insulin resistance. can also help reduce the androgen levels because it's improving your insulin right. balance. Um, helps slow your hair growth issues. Huh. Um, and helps you ovulate more regularly. And they will sometimes do that for somebody who's looking to get pregnant. They'll do a combination of metformin. Um, and metformin can also help, um, you know, lower blood sugar, can help balance your menstrual cycle and help you lose weight without, like, being on the pill. Um, so they'll do that for people with PCOS a lot. They tried to do that with me. Um, it My... I looked like I was pregnant. My stomach blew up. I had such intense side effects from it. I did it for like a month and I was like, I can't. The metformin? Yeah. I was like, oh. I can't do this anymore. Um, and I don't have the insulin resistance right. component to my PCOS. So um, then they also, remember, you know, recommend like hair removal medications and things like that. Um, ultimately, they're always going to recommend a change to diet and activity because it can help you lose weight, which can help reduce the symptoms or reduce the severity. Um, and if you have the insulin resistance, long term, that's always going to be good. You that know, recommendation is so frustrating, though, because yes. it's like, like I, I it's understand. so generic, and it yes. was mentioned a hundred times. I tried to like take it out when I could, but and like I understand that sometimes that really is the answer to right. the problem. Um, like with prediabetes or right. type two diabetes, like losing weight can mm-hmm. solve that problem, but it is so frustrating because it, like. I mean, I think we're all human. I just, like, just give me the pill that fixes it. And PCOS makes it much harder to lose weight. Yeah. And it goes into that, like, obesity bias that we were talking about where, like, obesity is seen as a personal failing, not – so then when you say just lose weight and just do diet and exercise, it's like, right, but, like, that then, like, if I don't do it, it's 
one hundred percent my fault. And I oh, think totally. I think that's part of the it's a moral failure on yes. me. It's not my biological makeup. Yeah. And I think me. that probably also goes to like the the perception of overweight people being lazy or non compliant mm-hmm. because it's that thing of like, well, like, okay, so now I'm looking down the barrel of a gun, basically, like, yeah. okay, if I don't lose this weight, then it's my fault. Mm-hmm. And there, you know, like, so you just get stuck in this, like, doom spiral. For sure. Which, like, is super easy to do. But then on top of it, it's like, well, it's already so hard for me to lose weight because I have PCOS. Like, it, like speaking you know. from experience, so hard. And it's, I feel like PCOS is... Because there's not a lot known about it, it's super common. Not a lot known about it. I so, mean, yeah, like one in ten people has it. Yeah, one in ten if, people with a uterus. Right, and if I'm telling a new provider that I have that, they're kind of like, I can, I can see them in their head rolling their eyes, like, yeah, okay, right. I'm like, folks, things that it can cause. Well, hold on, let me just mention this. One of the treatments, okay. I scrimped <laughs> when I read this. Oh boy. They can do a surgery as an option to improve fertility if the other treatments don't work. Ovarian drilling. Ovarian drilling is a procedure that makes tiny holes in the ovary with a laser or thin heated needle to restore normal ovulation. Absolutely. You know who invented that is the same guy that did all those uh, tests tests on the enslaved women. Yes. That's who invented that. That is... Bar- I read that. I was like, that is fucking barbaric. Why would you make holes just so that the egg comes I, out? I, I don't. Get it air? Do they know? Like when you have know. a cut and you have to like expose it to air so it dries out. And I heals. don't know. <laughs> I read that and I was like, that is absolutely not. If somebody said to me, we want to do ovarian drilling. Well, I guess I'm never going to get pregnant. Ovarian then. drilling. like Drilling. Drilling. Like a Keystone oil pipeline. Yes. <laughs> like, what the fuck? For oil. So I was very angry when I read that. Um, and then they also recommend shit like hair removal, like electrolysis and stuff. Like, oh, yeah, fucking thanks a lot. Well, it's treating a symptom that's not treating correct the and syndrome. I can also tell you, knowing people that have that have PS- PCOS that have had hair removal, it is not as effective. Mm-hmm. Because you, this isn't like regular hair growth. Right. There's a reason your body is like producing that hair. Right. And lasering it off is not fixing. It's correct. It's completely treating a symptom and you're going to spend a ton of fucking money and it's not going to be as effective. And even if you don't have PCOS, my understanding is that you will repeatedly have to have electrolysis done over mm-hmm. the course of your life mm-hmm. um, because your hair follicles will regenerate naturally eventually. regenerate. Yeah. yeah. So you will ultimately continue to grow hair in whatever area. Like if I, like as far as I know, I don't have PCOS. Mm-hmm. Um, I had it done on my mustache. For a little bit. Yeah. And it was super painful. And guess what? I still have a mustache. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I embrace it a little bit more now than I used to. Um, yeah. I was just, you know, aging where you just can't be fucked. Yeah. I'm, I'm just like, yeah, you know what? I mean, I'll I'll pluck the really offensive ones, but. Yeah. Or just use like a bleach strip. Like whatever. Yeah. You know. I, it, it is what it is. Like I can't. Totally. I'm not going to spend hours of my life waxing my mustache off if i have a special event if it's a special occasion if it's a special occasion yeah i might wax my mustache. like when you were forced to trim your armpit hair before that wedding yes i had a wedding to go to and i had to it was, it was requested if i could please trim my armpit hair tame the beast um, <laughs> yes put a muzzle on them fuckers <laughs> i'm kidding i'm kidding katie is on one today. i really am oh man i'm hyped I would also like to add that before we started recording, she had her backpack sitting on the floor and my <laughs> old ass dog went into her backpack and found a cookie and was trying to eat through the plastic to get to it. This dog does not have no, teeth. There's no teeth. He has hardly any teeth. But don't worry. He was still determined to get to that. And then she she caught him and he was like, what? I was just telling you where it was. I was letting you know it was here. You don't want to get stale. Da, 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 da. <laughs> anyway. Um, so comorbidities of this cluster of symptoms, uh, metabolic syndrome, 
which is a combination of high blood pressure, high blood sugar, and high cholesterol that increases your risk of blood, let me rephrase that, cardiovascular disease. <laughs> it's a heart and blood vessel disease. What the fuck? Cardiovascular You're trying disease. trying really hard to not plagiarize. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, heart and blood vessel disease. Okay. <laughs> we'll just say cardiovascular disease and stroke. Um, That's cool. You only already have two of those I things. I only have two of the three. Yeah. So it's so not. you don't have mel- metabolic syndrome. Melan melanonic syndrome. Mel melodabandamin. <laughs> yeah, well this one is I this is another one I'm not gonna be able to pronounce. <laughs> uh I'm just gonna say severe liver inflammation, which can be caused by uh fat buildup in the liver. Are you just trying to say cirrhosis? No, oh. it's non alcoholic. Oh. Cirrhotic? Statohepatitis? Oh, S T E A T O, S T E A E O, S T E A T O T O. Yeah, stato hepatitis. Um, also type two diabetes or prediabetes, sleep apnea. The risk for sleep apnea is five to ten times higher in people who have both obesity and PCOS than in those without PCOS. Hmm. Uh, depression, anxiety, and eating disorders. Fun. Other side effects. Not side effects, but, you know, comorbidities. Um, and they're saying it's caused by, you know, a combination of the impacts on your self-esteem because of all these physical effects of the diet. Right. As well as a hormonal imbalance, which is going to contribute to that depression and anxiety. And then, like, society giving people eating disorders. Correct. Yeah. Or this research which just says to lose weight 400 times like that's gonna fix all your problems turns out even after losing weight i still had pcos just like i still had high blood pressure after losing weight but at least you know how to make a chocolate cake sometimes true without poisoning everybody um sometimes also endometrial cancer so we have have absent or very irregular periods fewer than three or four periods a year which i've definitely gone through phases of my life where i had fewer than three or four a year uh for many years have a higher than average risk of developing endometrial cancer is that different than uterine cancer or is that Yeah, because this is – if you have, like, endometriosis, it's going to affect, like, the endometrial tissue, which is going to be in your abdomen. Well, your endometrial tissue is, like, the lining of your uterus versus right. your uterus. Right, but, like, every, you can still have endometrial cancer without having endometriosis. That's my understanding. Yeah. If you're a doctor <laughs> – I was trying to think of a more specific type of doctor, and I was like, no, nah, just a doctor. An endometriotologist. Yeah, if you're an endometriotologist, let us know if we're wrong. Um, um, I had no idea. I mean, I, it makes sense that that would be a type of cancer because it's an organ, I guess. But Yeah. And, but, whoa. I'd never, I've never heard of that before. At this point, I just feel like anything can have a cancer. Yeah. You name it, it can have a cancer. I didn't know penile cancer was a thing for a really long time. So um, so this uh, conversation on PCOS slash diabetes slash infertility <laughs> had surprisingly, so strange, run a little long. Um, <laughs> so we are going to snip it right here and you can tune in next week. Snip it. <laughs> Look at Austin Powers when he's like, zip it. Zip it. That's why I was thinking org. about it. <laughs> I was like, why is that ringing a vague bell in my yeah. head? Um, you can zip it and listen to next week's episode for the conclusion of that conversation uh, where we finish talking about all of those fun hormone things. Um, yeah. And we will see you next week. Yeah. Uh, in the meantime, uh, you can join our Patreon at patreon.com slash the bar is ankle high. Make sure you review us on uh, anywhere you can review us. Five stars, preferably. Oh um, stars. Five <laughs> stars are a bust. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But uh, if you're on Apple Podcasts, if you actually like leave five a five star review and write out a review with words, um, it really helps boost our visibility and gets us out there more, um, which is really helpful. Just on like the business side of things. And we really appreciate it and love and you. Our self-esteem, because it also makes us feel better about ourselves. <laughs> and if you want some merch, you can go to bit.ly slash ankle high merch, all one word. And yeah, one more time, um, 
because we talked about period stuff today, you can go to somedays.com and use the promo code the bar is ankle high at checkout for 20% off your order if you want some more natural um, or homeopathic, I guess, uh, period pain relief. Yes, like uh, some true comfort items. Yeah, I mean, I'm obsessed with that heating pad. So. Oh my god, I can't wait to eat uh, Yeah, I'm really pumped. And that balm. Yeah, that the cramp balm. cream. Stop calling it. <laughs> just a funny word to say. <laughs> it's just the LM noise that you're like obsessed Calm. with. <laughs> Calm balm. Oh my god. <laughs> but until then, <laughs> remember to be kind to yourself because the bar is ankle high. And periods can hurt. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in. We'll be here next Thursday with another episode to tangle your ear holes. In the meantime, the best way to support us is to follow us on Instagram at the bar is ankle high and to subscribe and leave us a five-star review on your preferred podcast streaming platform. It seems really simple, but it really is the best way to help us out, especially whenever you can actually write out a review. Great news. We have a new merch store that ships internationally and allows you to customize your merch on an endless array of products. You can head over to bit.ly slash ankle high merch to check it all out. If you want even more ankle high hot takes in your life and to have a few dollars to spare, you can also join our Patreon at patreon.com slash the bar is ankle high. There's three different tiers to choose from, $2 toe rings, $5 anklets, and $10 limbo champions. Everybody gets monthly horoscopes written by yours truly. Anklets get bi-weekly dysfunction junction episodes. And Limbo Champions get all of that, plus ad-free episodes. And they get added to our close friends list on Instagram. So head on over to patreon.com slash thebarisanklehigh and join today. Until next Thursday, remember to be kind to yourself because the bar is ankle high.